Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to part two of my Steve's Factory Manager Mod Spotlight. Uh, we've been looking at this really crazy mod that allows you for extreme control over liquids and items flowing to different machines in this Steve's Factory Manager network. As you can see, we've already set up a couple different things like putting coal and items into furnaces, dumping them into chests, crafting using wood, and uh, dumping the items like crafting tables into the output chest, specifying how many specific items there are, it's a complicated mod, so if you haven't watched part one yet, you absolutely should watch part one before you watch part two, because this uh, part two is really gonna build upon what we learned in part one. If you're a little fuzzy on some of the things in part one, maybe play with the mod a little bit and get a good strong feel for it, because part two is really a little bit more complicated. But absolutely, feel free to sit back and enjoy checking out all the different more complex stuff that you can do with Steve's Factory Manager. Let's get started looking at, mm, conditions sound cool. So a condition is a really nifty uh, control mechanism. You can specify uh, kind of like an if-then statement for anybody out there who's a little familiar with programming for uh, different scenarios to follow based on different um, descriptors. So let's take a look at a basic condition. Uh, what you can do is specify an inventory for your condition. So I'm going to choose the chest here on uh, the left, and we're going to go ahead and specify that as the target inventory. And then our condition target, we can specify different sides, right? So we're going to say the north side again just like in part one it really doesn't matter what side you do and now for items what condition or what do we want to look at in this chest to determine the output of the condition so for example I might want to check to see if there's any cobblestone in the chest and if there is uh, we can do something about it. Now we can say requires all or if any. This is really only useful if you're using multiple things. So if we wanted to check for cobblestone and maybe uh, you know some wooden planks, okay, we could say it requires both cobblestone and wooden planks, or it requires either one. So if either cobblestone or wooden planks, as long as there's one of these two items in here, that's what if any does. Requires all, requires both. But we're not going to complicate this too much. We're just going to go with cobblestone, okay? So we're going to say on the condition, this is a conditional, that there's any amount of cobblestone in this chest, we can proceed, okay? Uh, now, if you wanted to, you could also right-click to specify an amount. So let's just, for demonstration purposes, specify 10. So there needs to be 10 or more cobblestone inside this chest for this condition to equate to true. And you'll notice that there's two outputs, true and false. And there's a couple different things that we can do here. So let's go ahead and run this conditional through. I'm going to go ahead and... Um, create a real simple input output scenario. So we're going to do um, on the fact that it's true, uh, we're going to input from the chest here on the north side. We're going to move, let's say, wood planks. And I'm not gonna specify how many we move, we're just gonna move them all. And we're going to output them to this gold inventory right here. And I'm just gonna get everything out of there for now just to make this easier. Okay, so we're going to say inventory gold, target, doesn't matter which side, and the items will allow any items in. Okay, so our basic setup here is if there's 10 cobblestone inside this chest, go over to the input chest, which is the wooden one, pull out any and all oak wood planks that you find, and dump them into the output chest. And the output chest accepts any items that we want to send it. Let's go ahead and create our trigger, which is a one second. So every second, it's going to check the condition. So let's go ahead and put our oak wood planks in here. Notice, nothing's happening. The wood planks are not moving to the golden chest. Nothing's happening. Because our condition is checking for cobblestone, and it's not true. So it's not going to follow down this path. It's going to follow down the false path. And if we wanted to, we could have another thing happen on the false path. We could have it move some other item out of the chest. Or we could have it emit redstone, which we'll see in a little bit. There's a bunch of different conditions we can follow for the false path. But we don't have anything configured for the false path, so nothing is happening right now. I can go ahead and put six cobblestone in there it's still not going to equate to true because our condition here requires 10 cobblestone. Cool. Let's go ahead and put 10 or more cobblestone into the chest. Boom. As soon as there's more than 10 cobblestone in the chest, the wood is moved out. And it's going to continue to move wood out. So if we grabbed more wooden planks, they would immediately be pulled out within a second. But as soon as there's not 10 cobblestone in there, the wood planks will no longer be moved out of the chest until the condition is once again true, and then 
the wood planks are moved out. So with this kind of control, you can specify all kinds of scenarios. You can make sure you have certain items in your network, and you can make sure that uh, certain stuff's available before you do things. So like maybe um, you don't want to plant any saplings in your planter until you have more than 10 saplings on hand, something like that, right? So you can make sure that you have a certain number of saplings on hand, and if so, you can go ahead and move some, do whatever you want. There's a thousand scenarios for you might want to check for the existence of a certain number of items or any number of items before before you allow some function to occur. And in the event that you don't have a certain amount of items available or you don't have that, you could follow down the false path. Some pretty cool stuff right there. So speaking of redstone, there is a specific item in the mod, Steve's Factory Manager, that allows you to do a redstone emitter. So let's go ahead and hook this up. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hook this up right here, and we're going to emit uh, some redstone out the side. So how does this work? It's really pretty cool. Uh, all you need to do is specify create redstone emitter, and I'm going to come over here, and we can choose first the emitter. So you'll see that there's only one emitter on the network. Because this is a redstone emitter, it's only going to look at things that count as redstone emitters, so it's not looking at chests and tanks and all that other stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the one and only redstone emitter that I've placed down. You can specify which side the redstone comes out of. Uh, by default, it'll specify all sides, but I think west is the side here, right? If that's north, and this is the west face. So we'll allow the redstone to come out only the west face side. That looks pretty cool. And you can also choose strong or weak power. Uh, so in uh, vanilla Minecraft, weak power basically won't transmit to the adjacent block, whereas strong will. So if we were to, for example, place the redstone on top here, it's whether or not this block here you know, transmits that redstone signal as strong or false. We'll take a look at that in a minute. And then finally, we can control the output side. So we can do a fixed strength of 15. Okay, so whenever this thing, uh, you know, whenever some kind of connection gets to this emitter, it's going to emit a strength of 15. So you'll see right now it's off. If I connect my trigger, within a second it should activate and do 15. Pretty cool. Pretty straightforward. Uh, if we wanted to, there's a bunch of other controls we could do. So toggle is cool. It toggles it on and off. So every second it should toggle it on and off. There we go. We've just made a simple one second clock. Nice. Thanks, Steve's Factory Manager. That was easy. Uh, the other options, of course, um, are, let's say, fixed 15. We'll make it back to 15. Uh, what you could do is something like decrease. And what that'll do is it'll decrease it by the number that you specify uh, all at once. So let's take off this trigger. I'm going to actually set it to increase by 1 every time this thing occurs. So you ready? Go. And you'll note that it increases by 1 every second. So basically, um, every one second, it increases the current signal strength by one. So that's what increase does. And decrease just does the opposite. It decreases it by one, or whatever number you specify. So all the way up to a max of 15. Cool? Now, slightly different from that is not increase, but forward. This advances it one forward. The only difference is this, is that increase will stop when it gets to the max strength or the min strength, um, whereas... Uh, forward, we'll advance it forward one. So you can see it'll loop around. So once it gets to 15, it'll go forward one step, which basically loops back to zero, and then starts all over again. So the only difference between increase and forward is that increase stops at 15, forward continues along, and goes on to zero. Cool. And then finally, max will um, set the redstone strength to a max number. It won't increase it or decrease it. So, for example, it's currently at power 7. When it's set to max at 6, it won't go any, um, it won't change because it's already above the max. But if we set the output side to a max of 9, uh, what we should see here is it jumps up to 9. So that's pretty much what you're looking at here. And of course, you have pretty much the opposite conditional. So we have min. Uh, so let's do uh, 2, and we'll do decrease. So that'll drop it down by 2 every second, all the way down to a minimum of 0, at which point it won't go any further, unless we have it set to backward. And then it goes backwards by 2, and it goes past 0, and just keeps going around again. Pretty nifty stuff, right? So one of the really cool uses for this, instead of doing a trigger, uh, we might want to do something like a uh, conditional emitter. 
So we'll connect the output from our false condition here, and we'll say, hey, if your condition that we set up before, more than 10 cobblestone, is true, go ahead and start moving wood out of this chest and dumping into the gold chest. No problem. There's cobblestone in there. We'll keep moving wood over. Everybody will be happy. But in the event that that condition equates to false, maybe we want to emit a redstone signal and turn on some kind of light in our base so that we'll know that, hey, we just ran out of cobblestone. That's a crisis. Let's go ahead and set it up. So our emitter is going to be the redstone emitter. The side will be west, as we specified already. And our output will be a fixed signal strength of 15. So we'll just max out the signal, say, hey, emit a full signal strength of 15. And uh, whenever the condition is false, it's going to do that. So let's lay down our redstone again. Notice that it's not running. It's not emitting a redstone signal. And we're going to go ahead here and remove the cobblestone. And as soon as we do, the condition equates to false, and our redstone signal turns on. Cool. Now let's go ahead and put our cobblestone back in the chest. If you expected the redstone signal to turn off, it's not gonna, because we didn't specify anywhere for it to turn off. So what we're probably gonna need to do is uh, something like this. We're probably gonna have to move this guy down just a little bit and use one of those flow controls, right? So uh, there's that flow control. Uh, we're gonna specify that it's going to split we're going to connect our true connector here. One of the things you're going to do is start moving wood again. The other thing you're going to do is um, do another redstone emitter that's going to specify this guy on the west side. And of course, you can leave it on all sides if you want. Has a fixed signal strength of zero. Cool. And you'll notice now the redstone signal will turn off again. Pull the items out of the chest. It's back on. Put the items back in the chest, it goes off. So that's how you can control it. Pretty cool, huh? So you can do a lot of cool stuff with redstone. Now, of course, because you can output redstone, you have to assume you can also input redstone and do things based on redstone signals. And that's, of course, definitely the case. So by the way, the one other thing that I didn't show you guys is the pulse setting. If you just check this box, you can emit a pulse for a certain number of time, number of seconds, number of ticks, um, all kinds of cool stuff in there. So for example, if I wanted a redstone pulse that lasted half a second anytime our condition equated to false, uh, we could do that. So when we take the cobblestone out, you'll see that it'll pulse for half a second. Neat. And of course, keep in mind, if you have a pulse, it automatically turns off after half a second. So there's really no reason to do this extra setup to have it turn off. So finally, these pulse settings here, extend old. Let's assume that you had two emitters, or you had one emitter and you had two signals going to it at the same time. One of them was supposed to be two seconds, and the other one was supposed to be one second. All right, so extend old would basically create a three second pulse. And keep new means it only keeps the newest pulse, which would be the one second, so it would only emit a one second pulse. Keep old means that it will only keep the older pulse, so it would only emit two seconds. And keep all will do both signals at the same time, and it'll kind of add their signal strength. So if you're doing a signal strength like, you know, two and then five, it'll do a signal strength of seven. So pretty granular with the pulses, but you guys can have some fun with that. So let's look at reading redstone and doing stuff based on it. So I've gone ahead and gotten myself a redstone receiver, which is the opposite of your redstone emitter. This receives a redstone signal. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, add to the line here what's called a redstone condition. So this is a true-false condition similar to the item conditional, but this one's for redstone. We'll choose our redstone node, which is our receiver. And we'll choose whatever side. We'll just say any side. You could require a redstone signal on all sides or any side and choose which ones you want. And finally, you can specify the strength uh, and you can do it through a range. So if you could say like 1 through 15 or 1 through 1 if it has to be a 1. So whatever you want, really. I'll do 1 through 15. Any strength of redstone, I don't care. Um, we'll connect our every one second. Check if there's a redstone signal coming into the receiver. And if there is... Uh, we can go ahead and do whatever we want. So we could do an input and an output. Let me configure these real fast. So real quick, I configured it to move items from this chest into this one indiscriminately. I did an empty blacklist, so there's nothing that it's going to prevent from moving. And it's on the true condition. So whenever there is a redstone signal coming into here, it will move items from the wooden chest into the golden chest. Flip the lever. Boom, and now all of a sudden the golden chest is full of items, the wooden chest is empty. Uh, turn this off, and now no longer will items be allowed to flow, until of course the redstone signal is back on. Boom. Pretty cool, right? 
Now, one of the other neat things you could do is let's say we don't want to constantly monitor for a redstone signal, but when it receives a redstone signal, immediately trigger the action. Well, we can modify this trigger. So let's get rid of this conditional. And I'm just going to move these guys up and I'm going to change my interval. So instead of a one second interval, I'm going to make this redstone controlled. Oh boy, now we've got some serious business going on. What's happening here? Well, let's take a look. First, we'll choose our redstone receiver. That's this guy. And it's interval. Um, time between this command is triggered, so every so often, go ahead and uh, check for this redstone receiver. Okay? Redstone sides, we can choose whatever we want. Analog redstone, we control the strength again. And finally, connections is set to that redstone controlled. Neat, right? And now we can choose um, on high pulse, while high signal, while low signal and on low pulse. So basically, if we pulse a high signal, it'll trigger this once. Or while there's a high signal, it'll keep triggering it during the interval time, so every one second. So I'm gonna go ahead and say on high pulse, okay? Um, we're going to go ahead and move cobblestone. We'll move specify amount five, okay? So that should move five cobblestone out of this chest on a redstone pulse. You ready? Boom. And if we check in here, we'll see five cobblestone, but only five cobblestone. That's because we specified on the pulse, we're triggering the input to move to the output. Notice that it's not moving any more cobblestone. It moved it once and it's done. Okay, turn this off. Nothing's happening still. Trigger it again and it moves five again. Pretty cool, right? Now, if we change this and instead of connect it from on high pulse to while high signal, then what we should see is as long as there's a redstone signal applied, every one second, that interval that we defined earlier, is going to move five cobblestone. But as soon as the pulse is off, it'll stop moving stuff. Cool. And so that's what you see here. So the interval every one second while high signal. While low signal is kind of the opposite. As long as the redstone is off, it'll start moving five items at a time. And as soon as the redstone is on, it'll stop moving items. But of course, you might have noticed that it was still moving items. So why is that? Well, that's because we said while low signal, but our redstone sides are any side, okay? So if I changed this to only be the west side, and we move this guy over here, uh, he should stop moving items when redstone is applied to the receiver. Because when we had it on any side, there's no pulse going in here, so there is actually a low signal going in on this side. So that was basically equating to true, so it was allowing the low pulse. So now that I changed this trigger, I could have either said uh, requires all, so that means all sides need to be off, or I just said I only care about the west side, which is pretty much the case for this conditional. So once again, now that we've got it on low signal, if we turn this off, Items should start flowing out of this chest. And the signal on. There we go. And then, of course, the final one um, we've got on low pulse. This is pretty much uh, whenever a pulse is off. So let's move everything out for a moment. So we flip it off, and it'll move one set of items, and no more. Um, when we flip it on, nothing happens. And then we flip it off, it moves another set. Pretty cool, right? So you can trigger not only on an interval, but also on redstone pulses. And that's extremely powerful for doing some really cool stuff with it. And it probably goes without saying that we already looked at um, the item conditions and the redstone conditions. Liquid conditionals work pretty much the exact same way. You choose a tank, you choose a target, you choose the type of liquid to have inside of it, and then you have a true false output. Pretty much the same functionality that you would expect. So you can measure the amount of liquid you have, and hey, if we have more than 10,000 buckets worth of water in this tank, then emit true, otherwise emit false, do redstone control, whatever you want. So there's a couple other more advanced flow control things like variables, uh, for loops, and command groups, but I'm going to kind of hold off on those for a few minutes because I want to show you some of the other items uh, that are available in Steve's Factory Manager from Blocks. And we're going to take a look at what they can do right now, and then we'll come back to those more advanced things. All right, guys, the first item I want to show you here is the inventory relay. I'm going to go ahead and place this down and have it kind of uh, face this minecart with chest in it. And what this does is the inventory relay basically extends um, the relay of this thing. 
Alright guys, so one of the first things I'll show you is the inventory relay. This is a way of extending other inventories that might be mobile that can't directly connect to the system. As we've seen, if we go ahead and specify uh, an input and we say something like the gold chest, okay, and then we break that gold chest, when we go and look at the input again, it's lost that connection to the gold chest, right? Obvious. But if we place the gold chest back in the exact same spot, it's still not available and automatically selected. We have to go in and select it again. That might be a nuisance. What if we had something that could move? Uh, for example, what if we had a minecart with chest? Okay, the inventory relay is now a connection that can access that minecart with chest. All we have to do is, for our inventory target, choose that inventory relay. And basically, that inventory relay now has access to everything that's in front of it on that orange side, which is, in this case, the chest. So if we went ahead and put wood planks in there, and uh, we did a quick one second trigger, and we said, you know, pull from whatever side you want. We'll have a empty blacklist. And then we said an output could be the wooden chest here, south, doesn't matter, and empty blacklist again. Uh, we'll see that the items get pulled out of the minecart and into the chest. Cool. Not bad, right? So we put that in, the items get pulled out, um, you know, and if that minecart chest moves and then later comes back, you know, full of items or something, it still has access to it. We can place it back down or of course, you know, roll it down the hill or something like that and it has access to that. Pretty awesome. So similar to that is the advanced inventory relay. This guy's a little bit different. It just requires a piece of lapis to upgrade. This is almost the same thing except it can do something really cool. I'm gonna choose the input of the advanced inventory relay. I'm going to target, doesn't matter, items, we'll have everything, and we'll connect this up, trigger every second, cool. So what's this thing gonna do? Let's take a look. If I right click, I'm going to uh, go ahead and give permission to Direwolf20, cool. Um, yeah, we'll activate him, he's green, he's the owner, he has inventory access, Cool. When I go stand in front of this thing, hey, where'd all my items go? Ah, there they are. Nice. So the advanced inventory relay can interact with players. That's pretty much what it can do. Uh, so you can go ahead and see here, you can uh, obviously, you know, revoke permission, show editors, that kind of show. Um, and we can change permissions around, deactivate, activate, delete user, etc. So there's a couple different ways that you can, uh, you know, control this and specify, you know, what players have access to modify this block and also which players inventory can be moved around by this block. Pretty cool, right? So as you can see, the player has to actually walk up and click give permission. So you can add other players to this list. If you want someone to be able to um, you know, interact with this block, they have to come up, right click it, and then choose give permission. And by default, um, they won't have any permissions. I could go ahead and give them edit access. Um, and then I can activate them. So if, you know, Soren came here and he added his list, I'd have to go in and activate Soren so that he could interact with this inventory block. Neat. And of course, keep in mind, players are not sided, but you could use a block ID range. So if you really want to get granular and have it like equip armor or put stuff in your hotbar, you just need to know what inventory uh, ID slots these different inventory slots equate to. Now, item valves are pretty cool. Check this guy out. What the item valve is, it's basically going to suck items up in front of it. So we can specify the input to be the item valve. Uh, we're going to target uh, whatever direction we want, I think is fine. Um, so we'll just use all slots for there. And then items will be an empty blacklist again. So if we drop an item in front of it, it should wind up sucking that item up within a second. There it goes, and the item lands in the chest because we have it input being the item valve and the output being the chest. Now, it is only going to pick up items every so often. Just like a player can't pick up items, uh, there's like a delay before he can pick it back up. So uh, keep that in mind. But if you really want to work around that delay, you can get the rapid item valve, which is pretty much the exact same thing, but it works around that delay so that when we choose the inventory target of rapid item valve, and uh, you know, that's fine there. We'll choose north, make sure it's activated, and blacklist, empty list. As soon as the item falls, in front of it, it's gonna go ahead and pick it up. And what's cool about this is just like other stuff, you can black and whitelist stuff. So I might wanna whitelist um, something like wood planks, and then when I go ahead and drop an item in front of it, it's not gonna pick that item up unless it matches the whitelist item. So if I throw wood planks in front, boom, they get picked up, the cobblestone still did not. 
Pretty nifty, right? I like it. By the way, the range for this item valve is a 7x7x7 seven by seven by seven cube around it, or three blocks in every direction. So the next useful block is the block detector. This can detect if there's a block uh, adjacent to it and do something about it. So let's do a really simple one. Uh, I'm going to choose um, to do a trigger, which is, you know, this is the standard trigger, but I'm choosing block update detector. And my update detector is this one here that I just chose, okay? Uh, the interval could be every one second. And the update sides, we can say any update sides, any side at all. If you want to specify which side to monitor, that's fine. An update block, I'm just going to let it be anything, okay? So I'm going to say on high pulse, we're going to uh, do a redstone emitter. And it's this guy, and he's going to output a fixed signal strength of 15. And the trigger complaint is the whitelist is empty, so let's do something like this. I'll choose cobblestone. Cool. So now, in theory, when there's cobblestone there, it emits a redstone signal. When there's no cobblestone there, uh, we have to go ahead and specify what to do while low signal. So that's going to wind up being um, create redstone emitter while low signal. You're going to emit on all sides an output of zero. Cool. And you'll see here now cobblestone there. There we go. So I should probably make this while high signal and while low signal. Um, or we could do pulses, for example. That's probably a good idea. Let's do pulses. Because this is a block update detector. So on high pulse and on low pulse. That should be better. So on high pulse it goes on. On low pulse it goes off. Okay. Neat. So it's only when a block update occurs, um, not constantly monitoring for the existence of a block. But what's cool about this is you could also do stuff uh, on block update. Now, not all blocks trigger the on update event, uh, but this is really useful if you want to monitor something like wheat. So let's say you're growing wheat and you want to monitor for when the wheat gets to a certain metadata value. You could specify that and say, hey, when it gets to metadata value 3 or whatever fully grown wheat is, then emit a redstone signal. So for the simple use of the trigger, that works. Um, however, if you want, you can get a little bit more complex. And uh, these four squares here represent the bits of the metadata value. So basically, you know, um, if bit four is on, now I don't know what this is really all about. It's more like behind the scenes coding stuff and I barely understand it myself. So you guys probably won't need to use this too much, but if you really want to go super duper advanced, um, apparently according to VSWE for uh, rail tracks, for example, if the fourth bit is on, the rail is considered powered. So it can detect if the rail is powered if you just choose this one green box and you just put a one here. Cool, so I'm not 100% certain how all this works, but I guess, you know, it's, good if you really know what that's all about. I'll be honest with you, I'm not super familiar with it. And as for the other two, like let's say you wanted a condition to check um, three to five on the first bits or something like that, or you know one to three on the first two bits and this guy also needed to be a one, something like that. Uh, so you can get really complicated with your different bit values there. So again, the main purpose of the block detector is to detect if there's a block on the side and detect the metadata value. Again, super useful for things like crops, which grow and it could fire a redstone signal or move items from inventories when that crop is fully grown, for example. All right, guys, the last block we're going to look at in this spotlight episode is going to be the block gate. This guy is extremely cool. He can interact with the world around him. Let's take a look. So let's just do a trigger every one second. We're going to do an input which is going to basically be the block gate, okay? And we're going to do, um, you know, whatever side we want. doesn't really matter. And we'll say an empty blacklist. So you can do whatever you want, okay? And then our output will be the wooden chest. Any side, empty blacklist. Cool. We'll connect these two. I want to make sure this empty chest is here. So let's go ahead and connect this to this and the trigger here. So what's this thing going to do? Well, if we place a piece of cobblestone in front, boom, it breaks the cobblestone and puts it in the chest. Cool. So when it's an input, it's going to break whatever uh, is on that side right there and go ahead and just break it and throw it in the chest. Neat. Uh, now, if we wanted to, we could reverse this. So if we uh, change this, we made the input the chest. 
okay? Um, and then we made the output, the block gate, what you wind up with is it's wind up placing a block for you. Cool. And when I break it, it's going to place it again for us, or at least it should. Nope, never mind. We ran out of inventory spot. So there we go. Cool. So there you go. And you'll also notice there that when you go ahead and place a bunch of cobblestone in here, it might wind up, you know, spitting it out on the ground or something like that. So the thing to keep in mind here is that, yes, if you give it one piece of uh, cobble at a time, it'll try and place it down, but then when there's no more, nothing else to do with it, it might wind up dropping that on the ground rather than placing it. And of course, if you want to be super creative, you can also drop a hoe in here, and it should use the hoe, but it'll also, of course, spit it out moments later when it's done with it. So keep that in mind, you might want to combine this with the block detector and do a couple cool things. Like if you were really creative, you could probably do something with automated farm where you could, uh, you know, check for the fully grown uh, plant. If it's fully grown, break it with the block gate and then go ahead and plant a new crop there. By the way, if you right click on a specific side, it'll specify which side to place items on and uh, shift right click on a side to have it go to the opposite side. Neat. Also, you can interact with this block directly using something like a hopper. Cool. So basically, it's an inventory that places down whatever's in front of it, uh, whatever it has directly in front of it, or you know, whatever side you tell it to place down on. And I think that's a good wrapping up point for part two of Steve's Factory Manager's Mod Spotlight. We'll be back next time in part three to cover some of the more advanced, advanced features. So those were advanced features. We've got even more advanced features to cover. Uh, so we've still got cable clusters and camouflage and sign updaters and a couple other things we can take a look at item-wise uh, that we really didn't even look at yet. There's also the creative supplier, by the way. So if you're, you know, there's no recipe for this, but it allows creative mode interaction with the Factory Manager. Uh, within the interface, here there's a few things we haven't covered yet like variables for loops and groups and there's also uh, camouflage updaters and sign updaters as well that you can do some cool stuff with but we'll be back in part three to take a look at all that stuff for now darwell 20 signing off hope you guys enjoyed the mod spotlight part two on uh, steve's factory manager as always take it easy